Hello, Tamara. Hi, how are you? <laughs> so you're a painter, a tattoo artist, mm -hmm. and you also run a discipline press? Yes. Yes. And I'm going to do that so we can see the, the logo. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at your table uh, at the LA Art Book Fair. And um, can you tell us a bit about uh, Discipline Press? Um, yes, yeah, so Discipline Press has existed for about a year now, just over a year. Um, Discipline Press was a way for me to sort of formalize and refocus things I was already doing um, as far as, as publishing and, and compiling and curating. Um, I've done that type of stuff and self-publishing for, for years, for a very long time. Um, but this is my first attempt at my own publishing company. Um, so, discipline really has been focusing on um, to try to to try to keep it brief, um, connecting images of subculture, the imagery that's associated with it, with the context and the creators of it, um, and also trying to excavate and spotlight um, experiences of people who are marginalized within subculture. So, whether that's um, you know, female photographers who are who are chronically ill, um, queer people in tattooing, um, people of color, queer people in, in punk, um, queer people who are incarcerated, uh, people who are incarcerated in general. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a, a good introduction. And so, does that mean that you were doing zines before? Yes, I was doing zines for a long time. Um, I apologize, I'm a little sick yeah. right now, but I, <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, I got into DIY punk when I was maybe 15 or 16, mm -hmm. um, and zines were such a huge part of, of that. Uh, they were so informational and so important to me, developing a politic or, um, you know, understanding my own experience. And um, I actually have a background in printmaking. Um, mm -hmm. So when I started going to school for printmaking, that was a way for me to produce produce a lot of things, both for myself and other people, um, which is one of the reasons I, I love printmaking. It's very democratic and it's very useful for disseminating images and information. But, um, but so then I slowly realized I had become a resource for people to ask because they knew that it was something that I've been doing. So they would ask me where to get things printed or where to get t-shirts made and this and that. So I thought that I should just start to try to offer those resources in a more mm -hmm. tangible way. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, how does your different activities uh, link uh, together? The painting, the um, tattooing? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. To me, to me, it's all very connected, um, especially with my focus on, you know, in tattooing, I focus a lot on black and gray, a lot of Chicano, Chicano style imagery, um, and and that's a, a that was where one of the first projects for Discipline came about this um, this poster series because something that I'm often frustrated by with tattooing is that it's a way for images to be I mean, images can have a lot of different types of lives through tattooing. Um, they can be very divorced from their original context and their original meaning and take on a lot of new meanings or become meaningless at times. Mm -hmm. um, especially now with the internet as such a source uh, for mining images. So, you know, I see the popularization of Chicano tattooing um, and I think it's really amazing. I think mm -hmm. it's important to credit the art form, but I think it's equally as important to maintain the connection with the culture mm -hmm. that originated it and the contemporary reality of that. Mm -hmm. I think people want to look at it as a relic at times, um, especially with the popularity of Teen Angels. Teen Angels is incredible and hugely influential, obviously, but there's so many contemporary artists making work. It's not mm -hmm. a relic from the early 1980s mm -hmm. or 90s. Um, so are you fighting against a kind of a nostalgia that I see in Chicano culture? It always seems like before was better, and, and there's also a, an idealized way of looking at the past? Um, I think I, I think it's true about the nostalgia. I think that, that is, there's a romanticism to that that is a big part of Chicano culture, and I don't necessarily see that as a negative, mm -hmm. but I do see that, at least speaking for myself, mm -hmm. when I began to get into it, um, that was a really, a really good way for me to begin to explore the past and connect it with my own present. 
Uh, but I think that now, especially for young people, it's an important moment to consider where we want to take that into the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I see, uh, and I think that that's true of any generational divide, uh, because now we're seeing, I think, I think just across the board, uh, some conflict with um, just older generations of activists in, in general. Um, you know, for example, uh, protesters at Berkeley shutting down the speeches and older kind of original protesters from the 60s and 70s bemoaning uh, like the what they see as an attack on free speech. Mm -hmm. People having very different ideas of what uh, of what that looks like, and. Uh, and I think with Chicano culture too, I think there's a, pu a push with, for younger people to make it more trans inclusive, mm -hmm. more um, more feminist, mm. to really, you know, to to sometimes question the relationship it has to indigenous um, struggles and not wanting to appropriate indigenous mm -hmm. struggles uh, inappropriately. Um, and those, are, I think, are all really important critiques and really important for the growth of the mm. Chicano movement mm. and to keep it contemporary and to keep it um, to keep it moving forward. Yeah. yeah, romantic and contemporary. Then <laughs> I think it can be both. I think yeah, it can be both at the same time. And um, so uh, those issues. Um, this is sort of a magazine of discipline press, right? Um, because I see that this one is volume two and the other. Uh, and I, we have volume one, maybe some? Uh -huh. Yeah? Can you take, talk to us about this? Yeah, so the first publication I put out, uh, even before I formalized under the name Discipline Press, was Ugly, Dirty, Nasty, Noisy. Mm -hmm. um, which the title was taken from things that, were, terms that people used to describe both punk rock and New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I've lived in New York for, I in in the fall it'll be 12 years that I've lived in New York. Mm -hmm. so, so where are you from originally? I'm from Georgia. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, the title and the, the zine really was just an idea to try to try to get back to the community that I've been a part mm -hmm. of for so long and mm -hmm. do a collection of it and and, um, and have it in one place. Uh, especially with younger people, because sometimes it can feel a little bit like a dinosaur in punk, because <laughs> I've, I've been around for so long in New York, it feels like. But, um, but yeah, you know, these people have been friends of mine for so long. So I did that one volume, and then I did the second one, mm -hmm. which is the same, the same, but I expanded with some different people. Um, and then my assistant Riley curated the newest one, What We Do Is Secret. Which is a similar idea, but it's more worldwide, uh, global punk community, not just New York. So then the two that you had, had pointed to earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the interviews, those are two collections of interviews that I conducted and compiled. Um, and those came about because I was seeing a lot of work from artists who... Um, I, I, was seeing, I was seeing connective threads in their work, and I was seeing... I was just seeing certain themes there that I would look up interviews with them and never see them being asked to speak to those things. So I figured that I would just ask the questions that I wanted to hear the answers to. Um, so the body interviews is all people whose work uh, deals with the, the human body in one way or the other, whether it's their own body, um, uh, you know, as a, as a performer, um, others' bodies as, a, as photographers, furniture designers, fashion designers. Um, and there's a few in there that I think are really, are really, really potent, especially January Hunts, um, who's a trans woman, and um, she's a, a musician and an artist and um, a good friend of mine who I've known for a long time. Um, the, inter the second interviews uh, is a little more broad, and the interviews are a little more in-depth because they were mostly conducted in person versus over email. Mm-hmm, that's um, always better. <laughs> it's always better, yeah. So, um, um, but there's definitely some, some common themes there, you know, um, a lot of female artists, a couple of sex workers, some fetish professionals, um, some queer artists. There's Chris Burnson, who's a queer photographer. Um, so they are mostly uh, artists in this? Mostly artists, yeah. Um, can you tell us about this one? Okay, so this one is Penn Island. This is a, book, a zine that I published for um, an artist and tattooer named Sally Rose. 
and it is all these beautiful ballpoint drawings of penises. I'll, I'll show you my favorite one. Yes. <laughs> this one is my favorite one. Okay. <laughs> Um, go fuck yourself. <laughs> go fuck yourself. So, so, yeah, Sally is somebody that I interviewed for uh, my website, actually. And um, that's the beginning of a new book on queer identity and tattooing that I'm working on with um, Brody Kowinski. Okay. And there's one that you maybe sold out that you don't have here. It's called Especially Heinous. Oh, yeah, that's an older one. Um, yeah, Especially Heinous was a... I, so I love Law and Order SVU, and I started to take screenshots, caption screenshots, um, while I was working on one show because I was watching so much television while I was painting. And as I started to take these caption screenshots, I started to categorize them into different, um, I guess, different like lenses that you could be viewing the show through because there was a lot of like anti-police sentiment that, that I was finding. There was a lot of sort of like. Uh, like militant, radical feminist sentiment that you could, you know, like when you pull it out of the context of a police television show, um, it starts to take on a little bit of a different life. And but but that one was a collection of all um, uh, parts relating to kink. Oh um, yeah, mm -hmm. relating to kink and to BDSM throughout the whole series, which is quite long. I think now there's 18 seasons of it, um, and I. A lot of the show, especially more recently, I find to be pretty progressive in what mm. they what they cover. Um, but it definitely has moments that, especially in the older seasons, where mm -hmm. you can tell yeah. they're really uh, not they quite not quite so sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, but I was I was surprised to see that as a whole, their representation of kink is very it's very kink negative. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much always. Um, Oh, somebody was murdered and they tried to make it look like a BDSM scene gone awry. Mm. <laughs> um, I have one last question because the fair is starting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what, what's important in your work? What drives you to, to do this kind of publishing? Um, what's important to me, I think, is just sharing other people's experiences that I think are important to hear. I mean, amplifying the voices of people who I think need to be heard. That's that's something I'm grateful for, for having an audience through what I do. It's not necessarily to, to try to um, promote my own work, but promote people who, whose work I think is important. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you.